today I, I've titled this talk Economic Democracy and the Future of Work. Um, previously, I spoke about um, the idea of workplace democracy and the future of work, but this is uh, a bit more of an expansive, in some ways kind of an ambitious talk, um, because I want to think kind of broad strokes here about what I think are really important topics. Um, um, in an attempt to try and sort of clarify what I think are some of the most salient points uh, related to the future of work, and in particular um, related to questions uh, of automation. So briefly, I want to say something about automation in the future of work. Um, and, and I want to say something related to um, sort of the, the objective of this, this postdoc that I'm, that I'm going to be a part of and this uh, lecture series that I'm going to be a part of. Um, these debates are not new. Uh, you know, whether or not we should um, worry about technological unemployment, um, whether or not, you know, skill displacement is something that we should worry about. These are not new debates, but in many ways they have, they have ramped up and they have, they have new meaning in our lives. Um, and I, I think what's interesting here is just to sort of kick this off by looking at what I think is a, a very interesting piece of, piece of work um, from 1828. This is Robert C. Moore's March of the Intellect. So during the early 19th century in England, there was a, there was a debate sort of on, on the role of more widespread knowledge, um, largely due to industrialization, the spread of democratic principles, and also some fears of the more educated working classes. Um, and in some ways, this resembles, our, I think, our current discussions on automation and the future of work, um, both in terms of the sort of exponential growth of automation and artificial intelligence, but also in terms of the sort of clear class divide that I think emerges out of this new march of automation. Um, and, and what's relevant too to this picture, I think is, um, as I'll discuss in a moment, Marx's picture of the general intellect, which I think um, was a very prescient uh, piece of work of his. So I, the question sort of looms, you know, will automation usher in a, a utopian vision or will it serve as a mechanism for continued production and consumption uh, that increases our, our economic inequality and senses of alienation. Um, so I wanna start off briefly by just looking at um, a, a bit of work of Marx's in the Grundrisse, which were sort of his, uh, his notes leading to the publication of Capital Volume One. And in it, Marx writes, capital employs machinery only to the extent that it enables the worker to work a larger part of his time for capital to relate to a larger part of his time as time which does not belong to him to work longer for another. Through this process, the amount of labor necessary for the production of a given object is indeed reduced to a minimum, but only in order to realize a maximum of labor and the maximum number of such objects. This first, the first aspect is important because capital here quite unintentionally reduces human labor, expenditure of energy to a minimum. This will redound to the benefit of emancipated labor and is the condition of its emancipation. So as I said, these were in his notes in the Grundry. So this is what's largely called the, the fragment on the machine, um, but they were not published until 1937 and we don't get it translated into English until about 1973. And so we get from this uh, a deep engagement by the Italian autonomous tradition of thinkers from Paolo Virno to today thinking about folks like Antonio Negri and Michael Hart. Um, and crucial to this Italian autonomous position, um, and I'll argue in some senses uh, for what I'm going to be discussing today, is the autonomy of the working class vis-a-vis -vis capital in light of, uh, of, of productive advances. Um, so that is to say, with the development of technology under capitalism, we are at the same time seeing the conditions with which we can more readily build a post-capitalist future. Um, and in some ways, this appears paradoxical, right? That we have on the one hand, the development of productive forces under capitalism that have given rise to monopoly capital and increasing levels of um, economic inequality. But at the same time, the productive forces are such that if appropriated and put to use under democratic ownership, we could uh, potentially build a post-capitalist alternative. So now this is a very bold claim. I'm not gonna be arguing for that entire thing within the span of, of an hour, 45 minutes. Um, and it's not something I'm gonna try and defend uh, it, it, as a whole, but instead my goal is just a bit less ambitious for this talk, although I think still plenty ambitious. Um, so I want to build on what Marx is suggesting here in the fragment on the machines and suggest that much of the automation discourse could A, do with a nice dose of Marxian analysis, but also could benefit from viewing the problems that it is concerned with through the anti-democratic nature of 
the capitalist mode of production. So what are these broad categories of concern? What are we really talking about in the automation and future of work discourse? And I, I want to suggest that they can largely be broken down into the following categories. So on the one hand, we have so-called distributive concerns, questions about who gets access to what and how it should be distributed. Um, we have so-called post-work concerns, which are questions about how much should we work um, and should work be central to obtaining an income? Um, and in important ways, both those post-work concerns and meaningful work concerns are related to each other. But the last is the category of meaningful work concerns, which are the questions about whether or not work is inherently meaningful. Um, is work required to form identities and communities or is work an adaptive preference? So Michael Cholby is a great thinker at the University of Edinburgh who has written on work as an adaptive preference, sort of suggesting that um, you know, this is an unconscious formation of alternative preferences in light of the fact that we don't have meaningful options available to us. Um, so these, I think, are sort of the broad category of questions that we are concerned with when we're concerned with the sort of automation discourse and what questions about automation are going to do to the future of work. So my, my general thesis is, is this, that the distributive post-work and meaningful work concerns related to automation are best understood in relation to the anti-democratic nature of our contemporary capitalist economy. So what I think is important is the potential to experiment with and find answers to these distributive post-work and meaningful work concerns. And it relies on a change, it relies on changes in, in the mode of production. So what I ultimately want to suggest, and again, this is sort of a broad scope, broad view look here, that a system of economic democracy built on commitments to what I call participatory autonomy and relational equality, give us the tools to sort of contend with and ameliorate some of these concerns. So I think this is a, an important framing that I think is often left out of this discourse that I think needs to be a part of the sort of automation and future of work question. Um, and just to say something briefly about this idea of experimentation, um, I think that, again, I think it's important that we, we think about ways that we can exper experiment with the kinds of concerns that we're talking about here. Um, and I, I think we can try to answer some of these questions through philosophical reasoning. So questions about you know, the meaningfulness of work, questions about leisure. Um, it, but I think at the same time, um, we, we can't answer these questions without real practice. And so this experimentation with a variety of, of modes of being, I think is important. And so it's sort of my goal here to sort of sketch a vision of what this kind of experimental practice could look like. Um, and then the, the final thing that I'll say on this is, uh, you know, highlighting the importance of experimentation, I think in some ways shows my, my Marxist colors. Um, as many of you uh, know, Marx is uh, noted for suggesting that he's not interested in writing recipes for cookshops of the future. Um, so in some ways, it's strange that I'm sitting up here and saying, here's a vision of economic democracy that could ameliorate these concerns. But I do think it's crucial that Marx didn't say we shouldn't try and build cookshops of the future, which I, I think is relevant, you know, so that kind of experimentation process of what will be played out in a in a more democratic economy, I think, is is, is relevant. So um, to that end, I think that developing a system like economic democracy, which allows for a kind of a pluralist conception of the good life is nonetheless really important. So getting to this this first question of should we fear automation, right? Should should we worry about the sort of technological unemployment concerns um, and, and also distributive concerns related to, to automation? Um, there's a lot of literature on this. And so I can run through all of it, but I, I'm not gonna be doing that today because I think it's worthwhile to discuss some of the alternatives that are available to us. But you can't talk about automation and the future of work without citing uh, Frayne Osborne's 2013 working paper, which was eventually published in, 2017 that suggested that 47% of all jobs are at risk of automation. I mean, this is kind of the, um, the, the poster child for the contemporary automation fears. It's uh, sort of one of the most significant works. Um, so in an analysis of 702 occupations in the United States, Frayne Osborne found that most workers in transportation and logistics occupations together with the bulk of office and administrative support workers and labor in production occupations are at risk of automation, uh, with the phrase at risk indicating a potential to be automated within the next decade or two. Uh, now, again, they were writing this in 
2013, we're already almost to a decade. And so in some ways, these fears, I, I think you'll see later, can be overblown. Um, but then it's also important to note that they did point to some really important uh, ideas, which is pretty, uh, pretty clear in the literature that this largely affects low scale and low, low wage occupations, largely because these uh, rely on sort of routine level tasks rather than more creative and social skills, which they suggest it's relevant to consider retraining for more creative and social skills um, in, in order to ameliorate these sort of uh, job replacement concerns related to low skill and routine labor. Um, now, the prospect of disruptive automation, I think, is becoming an increasing concern among human rights organizations, too. Um, and the International Labor Organization uh, recently published a report that concerns the future of work. And it outlines both a conception for a future of decent work, um, as mandated by the Sustainable uh, Development Goals, um, as well as the potential for automation of jobs uh, globally. So this ILO report actually outlines various predictions, as you can see here, for the future of, uh, of employment, which include the World Bank's prediction that two thirds of all jobs in developing countries are susceptible to automation. Um, another ILO report's finding that 57% of all jobs in the Association of Southeast Asian Nations uh, are at risk of automation in the next 20 years. Um, a McKinsey report that claims that 60% of all occupations have at least 30% technical technically automatable activities. Um, and then finally, a report from PricewaterhouseCoopers, which suggests that roughly 38% of jobs in the US are at risk of automation. So in some ways, a very widespread view of the sort of uh, unemployment uh, fears here. So one of the other things that is, is made clear in this report as well is that uh, on top of the sort of fears of automation, we also find that there's clear down, increasing downward pressure on low wage sectors, as well as increases in long term unemployment and precarious work related to the introduction of automation. Um, what's more, uh, increasingly informal work is emerging in developing countries due to waves of technological disruption. Um, and this is this uh, non standard employment. Uh, presents an issue with respect to the development uh, uh, in that higher levels of technological disruption, including automation, appear to be main contributors of the rise of this non-standard employment, often considered sort of gig economy work. So non-standard employment, uh, which is categorized as temporary or contract employment, um, is often associated with job insecurity, earnings volatility, limited access to uh, social protections, um, or training and career advancement. Um, and importantly, high levels of job dissatisfaction, which later talking about the meaning question is, is an incredibly relevant um, fear. So it is important to note, however, that there, uh, there's sort of some pushback on some of the, this emer emerging literature. So it's pretty clear that automation is less likely in service sectors, which tend to be more common in developed nations. Now, of course, that doesn't tell us anything about the future. It tells us about existing automation trends, but it's pretty clear that in service sectors, which you know, about 70 to 80% of the US economy is made up uh, by the service sector, um, service sectors are, are considerably less likely um, to be automated. So one of the other important findings that folks like uh, Schlagel and Sumner find in their research is that while we're considering this question of unemployment, it's also important to look at the effect on wages that automation has. So they point to a clear stagnation of median wages as a result of increasing automation. Um, and this occurs even in the service sector where automation does occur, even though it is less likely. Again, there's, there's even more evidence on the downward pressure of, on, on wages. Um, Darren Asimoglu, uh, who is really uh, one of the the most prominent economists working on questions of automation in the future of work um, has found that one more robot per thousand workers reduces aggregate employment to population ratio by about 2%, uh, 0.2%, and aggregate wages by about 0.42%, um, citing a, a, down, a clear downward pressure on, on aggregate wages. But at the same time, there are others who are more skeptical of um, this approach that folks like Frey and Osborne take um, with respect to uh, technological unemployment and automation. So in their work uh, revisiting the risks of automation, 
uh, Arntz, Gregory, and Zierhan, they actually suggest that Frey and Osborne's predictions don't accurately reflect the levels to which we might actually encounter automation in the near future. Uh, rather, taking uh, an occupational level approach to the issue of automation, um, we find that the, the difference between occupational and job level approaches to automation show a, a very different level of risk. So at the occupational level, they found a roughly 38% chance of automation, whereas that risk drops to about 9% when we get to job level um, uh, discussions, where the actual tasks themselves um, are, are much more difficult to automate. Um, whereas the sort of broad scope view, it appears that these occupations are very easily um, automatable, um, but not so much once we get down to what it looks like on the sort of day-to-day -day level of, of, of these jobs. And of course, there's an asymmetric effect on routine tasks versus complex cognitive tasks, which this, um, this study accounts for. So, you know, in contrast to this sort of broader picture of automation is replacing jobs and it's something that we should worry about, there are others who are more skeptical. And Aaron Beninov, who argues in um, automation in the future of work, sort of suggests that automation theorists actually get this perspective wrong. That automation isn't actually what's causing uh, levels of unemployment and is not something that we should worry about as much as we worry about it. Um, and in fact, he, he suggests that it's not automation that's led to a reduction, reduction of jobs in manufacturing, which is often what this points to, but rather manufacturing has decreased over time due to overcapacity and competition in world markets. Um, and so we've seen a decline in output growth as well as a decline in productivity growth. So no sector has been able to replace the growth mechanisms made possible by manufacturing production. Um, and there's therefore low investment in capital goods and manufacturing, um, instead leading capital owners to engage in buyback schemes rather than investing in industrial production. So automation of some sectors, including agriculture, appear to have an effect, but automation actually might be a secondary concern to the larger concern of a stagnating economy at large. So the truth of technological unemployment is, is actually much more difficult to pin down um, than a lot of the automation theorists suggest. And in some ways, I, I, I want to suggest that uh, these concerns often don't tend to uh, address the real questions um, that we should be asking, which I think are often um, sort of wrapped in these more political questions, political and economic questions related to um, the capitalist mode of production. So we looked just briefly at sort of what I think are the distributive concerns that I was outlining, these questions about effects on uh, downward pressure on wages, as well as technological unemployment. But I want to turn for a second to some of the post-work and meaningful work concerns here too. Um, so uh, John Donaher, who actually spoke um, last spring with the IET, um, has a wonderful book called Automation and Utopia, where he sort of looks at um, the kinds of questions that we're asking. And borrowing from uh, Geos and Herzog's um, sort of taxonomy of what they call non-income good-making properties of work, he, he goes through sort of an investigation of what he sees as valuable components of work. Um, and Donner ends up suggesting that you know, we can actually find these goods outside of work, that we don't necessarily need to have work in order to enjoy these goods. But I think it's worth taking a look at what people see as um, questions related to meaning and the meaning of work and the fear that automation of jobs would lead to the reduction in these good producing and good making properties of work. Um, so one of them is the idea of mastery. So the idea of skill development and getting a re reward for De uh, developing and putting to use those skills. Another is a contribution, the sense of a sort of positive social contribution to those around you. Of course, we have a sense of community um, through workplace social relations. Um, and then this idea of social status, that work sort of gives us a kind of social status that we otherwise wouldn't have. Um, and like I said, Donaher argues that automation potentially replacing jobs either in whole or in part, so part of the jobs can also be replaced, runs the risk of us losing some of these good-making properties that are associated with work. Um, but of course, he suggests that we can find them elsewhere. 
I think that's right, but I, I kind of want to bracket that conversation for something else because my goal here is what are the conditions that we can create for us to uh, it, be able to experiment with the kinds of concerns that I'm outlining. Um, and I, I do want to point out something very briefly. Again, the, the Marxist in me really sees these sort of non-income good-making properties of work in some ways as a kind of positive expression of what Marx identifies as some of the alienating elements of capitalist relations of production. Um, and so I'm also highly skeptical that these goods, uh, these good-making properties of work are even remotely consistent with work under capitalism. So that's one of the other uh, sort of contentious issues here, that these are assumed goods that we already get from work. Um, and, and interestingly, there's, there's a good deal of um, sociological data to, to push back on the fact that these are actually good-making properties of work under our current, mm -hmm. under our current organization. Um, for instance, only about 32% of employees report being actively engaged at work. Um, if anybody's falling asleep in the audience, you may be one of those 32%, right? Um, a recent Pew poll found that only around 17% of Americans reported that their work gave them some source of meaning, right? So they were asked to report a, what gives them a sense of meaning in their lives. Only 17% actively chose to report that work gave them some sense of meaning. Of course, there's all kinds of problems with these kinds of polls, but there's other data that suggests too that there's a large discrepancy between the value that people place on work as work and the meaning that they actually get from that work. That there's a massive discrepancy between what people ascribe as work being meaningful versus their actual personal work not being meaningful at all, which again sort of gets back to this adaptive preference question, which I think is really important. Um, now, it's also important to, to note that around 19 million people who have resigned from their jobs during the so-called great resignation, although I resent that phrase to some degree, half of those employees reported being uh, undervalued by their organizations, undervalued by their managers, and lacked a sense of belonging. Um, which again, you know, it's, it's drawing from a population that actively left their work, but it's something that they're leaving and looking for. So in some ways, I'm, I'm skeptical that work either A, does this for people under its current uh, iteration, and I think most of the data suggests that this is not the case. Um, and, and the other thing that I'm skeptical about is that this is necessary for people to do at all, that that is a post-work world might actually better to attend to these kinds of properties. Um, but again, I want to bracket that conversation for later. Maybe we can punt that to the Q&A, and that's an interesting thing to talk about. I'm very interested in the concept of play and alternatives to work that can sort of create these good making properties. So here's kind of the, what I'm suggesting is a comprehensive approach to, to the, the problem so far. Maybe it's a bird's eye view approach. Um, what's clear is that some automation of jobs is likely. What that will lead to in the near future is not clear. Um, it seems like the predictions that were most uh, dominant in the public eye have at least not come true, but there's a latent potential there, right? Um, but to a certain degree, it's almost out of the question because I think what matters more are the, the relations of production that allow for technological unemployment to exist in the first place. Um, what is clear is that there is a downward pressure on wages. Um, and insofar as automation impacts jobs at both the occupational and task level, we run the risk of losing out on these meaningful good-making properties of work. Even if not everybody has access to them, we do lose the potential for those uh, work to be a realm where those good-making properties can, can find themselves. So what I'm suggesting is that this discourse needs an analysis of the capitalist mode of production and an alternative vision, which I call economic democracy and others have as well, where decision-making lies in the hands of those most affected by this automation. So. I think it's relevant to address these questions in more particular detail. So the distributive question, can capitalism with increased automation so-called deliver the goods, right? And here we're, we're worried about questions of economic inequality um, and being able to sort of preserve um, uh, a conception of the good life for most people. So what we have seen uh, recently is a dramatic decrease, um, uh, especially since 2000, uh, in the labor share of income, particularly explained by automation factors. 
I think part of the broader explanation for this staggering uh, growth of inequality and a lack of growth in real wages relates to worker power vis-a-vis capital and the imperatives of capital accumulation. Insofar as workers remain in an unfree and unequal relationship to their employers and their workplaces, decisions about wage structures, hours worked, the implementation of automation technologies, and so on, remain at the behest of capital owners. So capitalists are thereby incentivized to entertain sort of the post-work possibilities that we're considering here only insofar as they confer increases in productivity and profitability. Um, and I think that's relevant in light of what we're seeing here in terms of uh, dramatically increasing levels of inequality and decreasing levels in um, the labor share of income. So what's relevant here too is to look at net productivity versus hourly compensation. This is sort of a now famous graph, this bottom graph um, that folks I think are well aware of, the, of the discrepancy between productivity on the one hand and hourly compensation on the other. It's clear that we are using technologies and uh, methods of production that are increasingly productive, but of course, um, the compensation has not followed. Um, what's also relevant is to look at CEO to average worker compensation, which grew from roughly 31 to one in the 1970s to around 320 to one in 2020. So over the course of 50 years, um, increasing considerably. And again, as we've shown through the automation uh, research, uh, automation has been shown to increase economic inequality as low skilled workers are pushed out of work, squeezed into small, uh, a small range of tasks. So what about the post-work question? Can capitalism with, an increased, uh, with increased automation lead to decreased working time and increased leisure? Well, at least so far, it seems like that's not been the case. So productivity has risen by more than 400% since the 1950s. And yet full-time workers in the United States work on average 8.5 hours per day. So productivity increasing with very little increase, if at all, there's fluctuations in, in leisure time. And of course, no good automation and future of work uh, discussion uh, can go without mentioning Keynes's famous 15 hour work week of his, his vision for his his grandchildren. Um, and you know, there are structural reasons as to why Keynes's vision for a future with a 15 hour work week has not come to fruition that we've already made clear. Um, in the capitalist workplace, the implementation of labor saving technologies does not give workers a choice between increased consumption and increased leisure time. Rather, it leaves the employer the choice of laying off workers or increased profits for themselves and shareholders. Either way, there are very few incentives for the capitalist workplace to reduce working hours as increased production time, whether technologically augmented or not, is really in lockstep with its fiduciary responsibility to its shareholders and the imperatives of capital accumulation. So capitalists therefore have an incentive to reduce the working week only insofar as it demonstrates productivity gains for profit maximization. Um, and I think what's relevant here, as I'll talk about in a second, is the lack of what I call participatory autonomy and relational equality in the workplace. Um, those are key components of imagining sort of a more democratic uh, future. And then finally, this meaning question. Can capitalism with increased automation lead to meaningful work or meaning outside of work? Again, something that we can't necessarily answer because it's a prediction, but we have some interesting data that again suggests that there are relatively low levels of meaning that people find in relation to their work under our current model. Um, and importantly as well, those with higher incomes are likely to draw meaning from their work, which I think is unsurprising. But at the same time, if capitalism cannot deliver the goods, then it calls into question um, sort of the value of meaning creation under, under, uh, under the current system. And this question of meaning really um, on, on the critical side has two distinct perspectives, right? So one perspective is that work is a component of human flourishing and self-realization. Some might call this sort of like the humanist uh, position. Uh, on the socialist side, it's often considered the humanist socialist position that you know, there's something inherently valuable about work that we want to retain um, and that alienated work, if it can be overcome, will, you know, unalienated work can allow us um, the capacity for human flourishing and self-realization to the development of our skills. 
Um, but then the other side of this perspective is sort of the post-work ethic or the refusal of work perspective, which again, sort of rejects that we need work in order to find those components of human flourishing and self-realization. Um, and like I said, I think what's key here is really the unfreedom and lack of relational equality within the capitalist workplace that constrains this experimental uh, possibility about this above debate. We really are unable to make these kinds of choices because we are constrained by uh, our current relations of production. Um, and so too, I think, do private investment decisions. I do think they also constrain those kinds of experimentations. And I'll get to that in a second. Um, and then finally, this question of what work actually looks like and the use of technology to augment work. Um, technological design choices and approaches are made without the decision-making power of workers. And so that, again, I think is a relevant factor of people engaging with technologies that are um, that sort of thwart the potential for, for work becoming uh, this sort of first position where it's consistent with human flourishing and self-realization. So on to this question of economic democracy. And I have to I have to sort of cite those who come before me and the people that are influences in my thinking on this topic. One is David Schweikert and his much of his work in both against capitalism and after capitalism, where he lays out a system of economic democracy. Um, and then uh, who, who's a philosopher. And then Eric Olin Wright, who's a sociologist, um, his work envisioning real utopias, I think, um, both of which you know, take sort of a Marxist perspective um, but a, a market socialist perspective in particular, both of these thinkers have been largely influential about how I want to think about economic democracy. And um, these kinds of uh, systems, I think, are relevant to the kinds of questions that we're, we're talking about here. So I think what's important first is to sort of lay out what the, I'm going to call the economic Democrats, fundamental moral or normative concerns are. And they are both Participatory autonomy on the one hand, which is sort of a conception of positive freedom, and relational equality on the other hand, which is sort of a social conception of equality. And these positions, I think, are consistent across socialist thinkers, um, particularly sort of uh, social anarchism, but also among various sort of uh, left Marxist circles. Um, but also, you, you don't have to be a, a, a Marxist or, or, or even, um, you know, there are plenty of liberal thinkers, folks like Elizabeth Anderson who I think um, can find this view perfectly amenable. So on the one hand, we have this concept of participatory autonomy, which as I said, is a positive concept of freedom, which suggests that individuals have the right to self-determination and collective decision-making power within the social institutions to which they belong. Now, in some sense, this is a sort of Rousseauian commitment to an idea of collective self-rule. Um, and in that way, it is a positive conception of, uh, of freedom rather than a purely negative conception of freedom where freedom is something like non-domination. Um, and economic Democrats extend this ground for positive political freedom to all institutions that play a dominant role in the lives of individuals. So Tom Mallison, for instance, um, who takes an economic democracy approach, argues that the same principles that ground political freedom ought to extend to all institutions that play a dominant role in our lives including the extension of participatory autonomy to what he calls society's core economic associations, which he labels as workplaces, finance, and investment institutions. So I think we can, we can sort of say that under this economic democracy perspective, the principle of participatory autonomy is a normative commitment to self-determination and collective decision-making power over the institutions to which one belongs and whose consequences they must bear. And then on the other hand, as I said, it is a balance between these two conceptions of freedom and equality. On the other hand, we have a conception of relational equality, I think right now made most popular by folks like Elizabeth Anderson, again, uh, taking sort of a liberal approach to this, um, where relational equality views equality as a social relationship, which regards two people as equal when each accepts the obligation to justify their actions by principles acceptable to the other and in which they take mutual consultation, reciprocation, and recognition for granted. So um, again, this relational concept of equality attends to questions of how our social institutions treat individuals, including the workplace, rather than the distributive outcomes associated with those institutional arrangements, although that is a relevant factor, but it doesn't begin there. From, doesn't begin from a 
uh, a distributive perspective. So a relational egalitarian approach in this sense um, attends to unjust social relations that are embedded within our social institutions that produce unjust distributive outcomes. So again, uh, Anderson notes, to live in an egalitarian community then is to be free from oppression, to participate in and enjoy the goods of society and to participate in democratic self-governance. And she herself wants to extend this principle even to the workplace in her most recent work, um, Private Government. So with that as sort of the backdrop of what grounds this larger picture of economic democracy. And again, I just wanna keep everything in focus. My, my goal here is to think about an alternative system that can allow us to, to tend, I'm, I'm willing to be moved on different positions uh, related to economic democracy. There are a variety of systems of economic democracy out there, a variety of post-capitalist alternatives, but in general, they tend to combine these uh, sort of following principles. Um, and, and the last one is sort of a newer one that I think I'm adding to this discussion. So the first is the democratization of work. Um, and this, in essence, would uh, embody the development of cooperative enterprises, where within those enterprises, there is one worker, one vote. Um, there are different ways of thinking about taxing such organizations or developing them. Um, Schweikert's approach, for instance, um, workers lease capital assets from the state, and then there is a capital assets tax that goes into the social investment fund, which I'll talk about during the democratization of investment. Um, and then there's, at the same time, a maintenance of the market for some goods and services. Now, the obvious goal under this kind of system is the decommodification of a large number of necessary goods. But of course, uh, and we can get into this in the Q&A if you'd like. I think there are relevant reasons for markets to stick around. I think the sort of socialist calculation debate has all kinds of problems that we need to deal with. But nonetheless, this perspective keeps intact a, a, a sort of a system of a market system of cooperative enterprises. Now, at the same time, we also have as a part of our vision for economic democracy, the democratization of investment institutions. So essentially what this would look like is the, a system of democratically account, accountable public investment banks with a portion of investment funds set aside for national, regional, and local public projects, um, what I sort of call the decommodifying effort to, to develop and decommodify what would be debated and, and, and democratically decided upon as sort of uh, basic goods. These are questions surrounding education, healthcare, the kinds of things that um, we in industrialized society would hope that we could have, but unfortunately do not. Um, and so this at the same time also serves as the main mechanism to finance and support these cooperative enterprises, um, while at the same time adhering to established criteria. Um, and under a democratic investment model, at each level there would be um, methods of uh, democratic decision-making, voted on by localities, uh, regions, and at the, the federal level. So the goal here is you obviously want to maintain um, as much uh, participatory democratic engagement in these institutions as possible. Um, and then another piece of this uh, democratizing of investment is a participatory budgeting mechanism for local decision-making. And this will be relevant later when I talk about the value of participatory budgeting uh, related to the development of labor-saving technologies and the sharing of those kinds of technologies at the local level to be able to build uh, sort of what I call closed resource loops and thinking about ways that we can um, ameliorate these, these automation concerns. And then I also have on here the question of UBI. This is a debated concept um, uh, in the sort of post-workerist world, but most people think that a UBI or even uh, a negative income tax, um, something along those lines is valuable. I have come around to the idea of UBI. Um, uh, there, are, there are some issues with it. Again, punt it to the Q&A, we can talk about that. But I think, um, I, I think that's a relevant component of, of what we're talking about here. And then the final piece of this economic democracy puzzle is the democratization of what I'm calling the digital commons. Um, and, and the reason I'm, I'm talking about this is in large part, this comes out of a lot of my dissertation research on um, the emergence of platform capitalism and the um, 
sort of what has been called digital primitive accumulation to again steal some language from from the marxist tradition um but largely what this would look like is in the same way as developing cooperative enterprises um, in the physical world looking to develop platform cooperatives which have physical compo components of course but also rely on um, a digital network so platform cooperativism, we can talk about more, but I think has really valuable things to add to this conversation um, related to questions and fears about unemployment and uh, the depression of wages. But then there's also some other components here to this democratic digital commons, including for instance, the development of digital public utilities to be able to offset the power of the Googles and the Facebooks of the world. Um, contentious, but there are a number of really good thinkers who've written a lot on these ideas recently. Uh, James Muldoon, in particular, wrote a wonderful work called uh, Platform uh, Capitalism that talks uh, specifically about the development of digital public utilities. And then some broader questions about universal internet access, um, uh, data privacy and data trusts, low no code automation, copy left, copy fair. I'll talk about this more in a second, so I'm not just running through. So let's turn very quickly to the democratization of work. Can the democratization of work attend to some of these concerns that are related to automation in the future of work? Well, in some senses, we have some data that we can look at in order to look at the, um, the increase of power of workers vis-a-vis -vis capital to suggest that yes, there are po likely positive distributive outcomes to come with the development of the democratization of work. So on the one hand, unionized workers earn on average 13.2% more than their non-unionized industry peers. And the mechanisms around that are, are obvious, right? It's worker power vis-a-vis -vis capital. And importantly, worker cooperatives and firms with board representation are also less likely to experience unemployment during economic crises, due largely to the ability for democratically established work sharing and work flexibility agreements, as well as compensation reorganization. And then importantly, you know, we highlighted previously the explosion of inequality intra-firm within capitalist firms, where it currently sits at 320 to one highest to average paid workers. In cooperatives, cooperatives tend to have significantly lower intra-firm inequality. Mondragon, which is the, high, the, the largest cooperative enterprise in the world, um, which is a, a combination of about uh, 96 different uh, cooperatives in the Basque region of Spain um, with 81,000 employees has a highest to lowest employee pay ratio of nine to one, um, demonstrating a significant reduction in, in these worries about interfirm, intra firm inequality. Um, Cooperative Home Care Associates, which is a, a group out of New York, um, has the highest to lowest paid employee ratio of 11 to one. I'm currently trying to, to work with several cooperative organizations in, in East Boston, actually, uh, just moved here two, two weeks ago, but gathering more data on this, I think is relevant to sort of piece together these kinds of questions. Um, and then importantly, and, and I think this ought not be left out, nationally, around 66% of all worker-owned cooperatives are women-owned. Um, and roughly 60% of all new worker-owned cooperatives since 2010 are started by people of color. Um, and Cooperation Jackson in Jackson, Mississippi, it's a Black-owned cooperative um, that I'll talk a bit about later that has uh, attempted to deal with many of the problems related to automation in the future of work years. So those are some of the numbers that we can look at, but theoretically speaking, we also have uh, some arguments to be made for the value of the democratization of work here. So under a democratic workplace, technological unemployment becomes a matter of choice, right? And at the same time, technological de-skilling versus technological enhancement of labor becomes a decision that's localized to the workers themselves. This is what uh, Murray Bookchin, for any Bookchinites out there, likes to call technologies of life, um, where the actual technological production and what gets used are a matter of human enhancing um, technological advances rather than de-skilling. And at the same time, there's also a tendency for democratic firms to remain small, largely because of this fact of work, one worker, one vote doesn't serve the same kind of growth imperative that capitalist enterprises do, largely because increasing shares of profit did not necessarily relate to increasing profit for the workers themselves. So there's a tendency for cooperatives to actually 
sort of grow and then uh, stable out at a, a certain level. So again, it becomes an option to reduce unemployment by having people work fewer hours. It becomes an option to reduce underemployment by part-time work becoming a full-time equivalent. So you know, in, in these conversations, technological unemployment is often assumed to be a kind of inevitability. But I think workers' fears are less about technological unemployment than unequal power relations vis-a-vis -vis capital. Um, as we've mentioned, technologies have been shown to exert downward pressure on wages and the creation of precarious and informal forms of work, which undermines the bargaining power of organized labor, and also underemployment. And in many ways, I think that's significantly more relevant to workers' lives, particularly in a U.S. economy that's characterized by 3.5% uh, unemployment rate or so. So those, those previous questions were addressing some of those post-work concerns, thinking about leisure time, labor-enhancing technologies as a mechanism for increasing leisure time. That becomes a matter of democratic decision-making by the workers themselves. Now, when it comes to those meaning questions, what's really important is uh, the idea of job design for meaning creation. So there's good data to suggest that job design is actually a key component of the way that people find meaning at work. And if people are involved in that job design, it significantly increases the chances of them act actively finding meaning within their work. Again, we can punt the question about whether or not we need to find meaning in those kinds of questions at work to the Q&A. Um, but at the same time, worker cooperatives, due to a variety of factors, including solidarity among workers, increased compensation, reduction of inter-firm inequalities, and the sense of building a community have been shown to contribute positively uh, to work, worker satisfaction and meaningful work as compared to their capitalist counterparts. Um, and I think this is largely uh, coherent with what we've been discussing before about worker power vis-a-vis -vis capital. So let's briefly turn to the question of democratic investment then. Um, but the idea of democratic investment, again, there's two key components to this, a system of federated public investment banks that establishes banking as a public utility. And at the same time, a participatory budgeting mechanism that allows for local democratic oversight over public investment decisions. So I want to suggest that private control over investment under our current model constrains decisions about the implementation of labor saving technologies that do not result from immediate profit and, and capital accumulation. And at the same time, the decommodification of goods such as healthcare housing um, education and so on that would be possible under a system of democratic investment would allow for greater experimental alternatives to the value of work because work becomes less key to finding access to those resources. Insofar as healthcare is tied to em employment, um, that becomes a stick um, um, to, to sort of maintain uh, the labor force. And of course, then we have these, these larger questions about UBI, which I think is incredibly relevant, but also increasingly this question of a universal capital endowment. So for anybody who's read some of Thomas uh, Piketty's newest work, he suggests a, a universal capital endowment of $180,000 when people turn 25 as a mechanism for uh, wealth reduction. So anybody who just turned 25 in here, you know, it seems like an appealing prospect, but there are other reasons uh, why that's appealing. In terms of this question of participatory budgeting, um, at the local level, participatory budgeting mechanisms could allow for states, municipalities, and neighborhoods to allocate investment funds based on the needs of local constituents through citizens' assemblies. And these mechanisms could be employed to democratically manage the development and implementation of local technological advancements that could be made available to communities, such as locally owned 3D printing technologies uh, and fabrication laboratories or fab labs, which can serve as local production needs external to market conditions. Um, and I told you earlier that I would discuss Cooperation Jackson. So both Cooperation Jackson and also the Catalan Integral Cooperative, which is in Catalonia, makes use of these exact, um, these exact models, not only in terms of participatory budgeting, but also the development of 3D printing technologies and fab labs as a way of moving uh, the creation of goods external to the market and instead up to democratic decision-making by uh, local economies. 
So in some ways, this, this has been shown to reduce economies of scale by creating what are known as closed resource loops, where essentially you're not relying on as many imports and exports. Um, and as I said, this is a form of local planning combined with cooperative markets, um, which could yield some, some positive benefits uh, related to these questions of um, the development of labor-saving technologies. So as I said, social control over investment in general and participatory budgeting mechanisms could guarantee funds to develop automation technologies that are made non-proprietary and freely available to networks of cooperatives through a digital commons, um, which I will discuss in a moment. So democratizing the digital commons. First of all, I wanna say that I think this idea is relevant to the broader discussion of automation in the future of work as we continue to experience the kinds of um, algorithmic and autonomous domination of big tech firms um, and their use of digital users for the production of economic value. So in many ways, this harkens back to Marx's idea of the general intellect adopted by the Italian autonomous thinkers and the idea that social knowledge production will become kind of a key component of capitalist production um, that's outsourced to the social factory. So all of us who spend all day long searching on Google and Facebook and our gig workers are actively producing data that is producing economic value for these firms. Um, so that's in one way why, why it's, th this question is, is relevant. Um, but I think similar to the question of democratizing investment, the digital commons represents a kind of uh, collective production value in the form of not only data, but also knowledge production um, that under our current model tends to be captured um, as Hess and Ostrom, Eleanor Ostrom, a great thinker of the commons, points out. Um, so, you know, what was once proprietary goods are now captured by access to new technologies. And so my goal with thinking about the development of a democratic digital commons is um, sort of a re-non-proprietary gooding <laughs> the proprietary goods that have been captured uh, via the commons, um, as, as Ostrom points out. So what I think is relevant here is the development of a network, like I said, of digital public platforms, but also platform cooperatives, and also peer-to-peer -peer sharing networks um, that can share non-proprietary labor-saving technologies, um, including what's become now known as low and no-code automation technologies, which are developed specifically for users with no coding experience to be able to implement certain automation technologies in whatever work they're using. Um, and this has been shown successful in, in a variety of places, including in Catalonia. And then this final question of, of data trust. So data trusts are a form of democratic stewardship of data for the common good. I think this is a relevant part of this kind of uh, overview of a democratic digital commons. And in many ways, data can be used in a broader context um, in order to provide large public data sets um, to be utilities for the purposes of, as I say, the public good. So federal, state, and regional, and municipal level data trusts could be used to aid in the rapid development of labor-saving technologies to be employed by worker cooperatives and through the public sector. So again, I think democratic control over big data also holds the potential to meet uh, goods and services needs that at one point were viewed sort of impossible in the socialist calculation debate. So there's room for sort of planning within this model as well. So broadly speaking, what does this look like? And then I'm done, I promise. I think what we have here are, is a framework in order to address what I'm thinking as these distributive post-work and meaningful work concerns. So as I've mentioned, the democratization of work as it relates to distributive concerns, likely seeing higher wages, lower levels of inequality, stability during economic crises, post-work concerns, now the reduction of working hours for increased leisure lays in the hands of individuals in those firms rather than at the behest of capital owners. And then the possibility for meaningful work creation. We have the opportunity for workers themselves to um, advocate for the development of technologies for life, the use of technologies for life. Again, labor versus leisure becomes a choice um, within those firms. Job design and job rotation, as I mentioned, was a key component of meaning creation. And then of course, there's good data to suggest that unionized and also uh, 
um, democratic workplaces find a significant a portion of their meaning in community and solidarity. Similarly, under democratic investment, we have the decommodification of necessary goods. This is a funding source for cooperatives and then a UBI proposal, which we can talk about later as well. Participatory budgeting allows for the egalitarian share in publicly funded labor saving technologies. And then at the same time, it also allows for community control over investment for community members to, uh, to make decisions uh, based on not only the community's needs, but also uh, some of these larger meaning making questions. And then finally, this question of the democratized digital commons. We have questions about data trusts and um, sort of peer to peer labor as a mechanism for uh, creating public labor-saving technologies that are non-proprietary. Um, at the same time, post-work concerns, sharing technological designs that are labor-saving would allow for that sort of uh, leisure exp uh, uh, exploration. And then finally, the, the sort of community that is built by the kind of peer-to-peer -peer networks that are built on the kinds of digital platforms that exist external to the market now. So again, I think, getting back to my thesis, right? What is valuable to these concerns is taking a step back and looking at and suggesting that these questions are actually best understood in relation to the anti-democratic nature of our contemporary capitalist economy. And I hope that a system of economic democracy at least allows people to see the potential for us to be able to ameliorate these, these kinds of concerns. <laughs>